Good morning. Welcome to a quick bulletin from the angry astronaut in a good mood today because finally we got the go ahead for the Virgin Orbit launch, although I can't really uh, confirm the exact date. What I can tell you is I'm going home on the 15th and I intend to cover the launch before then. So uh, go ahead and do the math yourself as far as that's concerned, but got my uh, British space flight t-shirt on today. Uh, links in the description, by the way, if you're interested in getting one of these yourself. In the meantime, we need to talk about a rocket crash. Subscribe! <laughs> So a couple of months ago, I was actually in Scotland, uh, I was in Yorkshire before that, and then I got this mysterious invitation to go pick up my producer who uh, does some additional video work. That's actually his main company uh, is a, a Total Space Productions. Uh, they do video work, but I got this call saying that they had this job and he needed a ride. And then I found myself in Edinburgh um, with him in tow at the Skyro facilities and before I knew it I had signed a non-disclosure agreement and was doing some promotional work for them. So I got to do a quick interview with their lead engineer in charge of the Skylark L project. This is a suborbital rocket that they were launching from northern Iceland under extremely secretive conditions. Uh, they weren't going to announce anything about this until the rocket had actually launched. So I was essentially sworn to secrecy uh, several weeks prior to the launch. So kept my word, uh, carried out the interview. It's actually on their YouTube channel right now. But as a lot of you probably know, they had a whole lead up to it. Man, a tremendous amount of work that they had to go through in order to get the mobile launch platform to where it needed to be in Iceland in impossible conditions, unbelievably bad weather. Nobody else around because nobody was crazy enough to go out to that part of Iceland at this time of year. They lit the rocket, it ascended a couple hundred meters, and then crashed right into the North Atlantic. Of course, the obvious question is, why did this happen? I mean, what a huge disappointment. All of the work, all of the effort, both in terms of fabrication, engineering, logistics to get this damn thing out there, all of that for this massive anti-climax. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share with you the details on this rocket, the engineering that goes into it, a lot of its features, all of the excitement really that existed and was permeating the atmosphere at Skyrora prior to this disaster. And uh, I can't really call it a disaster, actually, more of an anomaly. I'd say that's the better way to describe it. And uh, just kind of share with you how... All of this effort and all of this preparation can be absolutely sabotaged by one little mistake. And by the way, if you're interested in seeing a big, spectacular Falcon 9, you know, style crash explosion or all that kind of thing, you're not going to see it here. All right. If that's all you're interested in is a great big fireworks display, you might want to go to a different channel. But if you're interested in discovering exactly why a rocket crashes and how so much effort and so much work can be sabotaged by one mistake, well, keep watching. Tell me about this new rocket, the Skylark L. What's it made out of? And, and tell me about the fuel. Yeah, the Skylark L is a single stage liquid five pound suborbital launch vehicle. It's permanently manufactured from composite overwrap tanks and aluminium. The vehicle is guided. We use thrust vector control on the engines provide Steven. The propulsion system consists of a single 30 kilonewton rocket engine operating on kerosene and high test peroxide. This provides a thrust to enable the vehicle to reach an apogee of over 100 kilometers. So what unique selling points do you have for the Skylark L? We have many. The vehicle firstly has low G loading, so less than 5 Gs. This is due to the low thrust to weight ratio of the vehicle. This enables a smoother takeoff. This is actually a great benefit to our customers as their payloads experience lower G forces during takeoff and hence need less strict vibration load margins during design. Secondly, the emissions produced have 45% less CO2 products than conventional oxygen and kerosene. This is due to the molecular makeup of our hydrogen peroxide. We're going to move on to the mobile launch complex, something that makes your company kind of unique, I think. 
How has the design been determined for the mobile launch complex? The full ground segment is modular and mobile. Being based on shipping containers, this allows an easier transportation to anywhere in the world. An example of this is our ability to set up a spaceport in Iceland within 14 days, including shipping there. How long would it take to construct one of these mobile launch complexes? From full pack down configuration, three days to unpack and set up, and then two days before final flight checks and launch. Okay, just in case you weren't paying attention, that is a huge detail. The ability to do a pack up and deployment in 14 days, that is absolutely insane. And also, as Skyrora demonstrated, they can do this just about anywhere under any weather conditions. I mean, what was going on in Iceland with roads getting washed out and everything else were the most hostile conditions that you could possibly imagine and yet they managed to get everything accomplished and get right up to the point of launch without any significant problems as a matter of fact as you're going to see a little bit later on they did absolutely everything right right up to the point of ignition. So when we're talking about rapid deployment, something that Astra is trying to accomplish, something that Virgin Orbit is trying to accomplish with horizontal launch, it would seem that Skyrora is right in there with them. And rapid deployment is a big thing for a lot of satellite providers. So what are the containers and, and what are they used for? Well, due to there being no spaceport in the UK company set up and built and operational, we had to go and build one that was agnostic of location. Therefore, the biggest benefit that we can relocate our whole space and ground segment to a suitable location in a cost-effective and efficient manner. How far has Skyrora come as a company to reach this point? The team have developed and hit some major milestones in the past few years. We start in 2017 with just a handful of people and they employ over 100 staff and have five facilities in Scotland alone. We've been working on the Skylock L since 2019 and in 2020 we performed our biggest milestone which was the static fire test in Kildamori. This was successful and many lessons were learned from that um, operation. This got us to where we are today. On the Excel front, we have just completed the second stage static fire test, a massive achievement for Skyo and the UK space sector. So what are some of the challenges you faced in trying to launch from Iceland? We've had many, but definitely regulatory is the number one challenge we've had. We've had to work with the Icelandic government to actually rewrite Icelandic law that allows us to perform this launch. We have to work with many stakeholders to get us to this point. We also have the weather struggle against us. The wind speeds are very high and we need to monitor them closely to enable a launch. How many engineers do you have working on this mission and what are the different roles that are needed? So 27 are going to be in this mission and operation. For the Skylark vehicle itself, I would say all employees have worked on it in some capacity during its project one time, and that's why it's personal to us all. How hard has your team worked to get to this point? Oh, wow, amazingly well. Using ingenuity and teamwork to get us there, I'm so proud of everyone in this team. And will there be more Skylark L launches, and, and will they be from Iceland or someplace else? Yeah, of course, we have vehicle number two. It is just a few meters away from us now on the factory floor. And so here's what happened moment by moment. The normal procedure that should have been observed during this launch is to start off with the propellant, then the oxidizer, then ignition. But because of a fault in the code, the propellant was loaded, then ignition, and then the oxidizer. At the last second, they tried to abort, but it was too late. And even though all they were doing was loading it up with propellant, which theoretically shouldn't have allowed the rocket to fly at all, there was enough hydrogen peroxide left over from previous fueling processes to get the rocket airborne for a few seconds, during which time it ascended a couple hundred meters and plunged into the ocean. 
After all that engineering and fabrication, after the Herculean effort that it took to deploy this rocket and its mobile launch platform under impossible conditions into one of the most hostile places on Earth, one line of bad code wrecked the whole thing, which again demonstrates just how easily something like this can happen and just how one tiny mistake can result in an anomaly. Space is hard and all also unforgiving. And by the way, if you're curious as to why we didn't get to see the rocket actually go into the ocean or anything along those lines, well, the entire coastline was shrouded in fog for one thing, and secondly, nobody who was managing the cameras expected the rocket to just go plunging right back into the ocean. Nobody really anticipated that, and so nobody really got the shot. The only thing that was kind of interesting is the rocket taking off at a really kind of crazy looking angle. However, that is something that Skyrora did not authorize to be released, but the BBC did link it. So if you're interested in looking at that, I do have it linked in the description, but it's not something I was going to rebroadcast here because Skyrora didn't want it rebroadcasted and I respect that. That being the case though, this is just one example that I wanted to make sure I shared with all of you to demonstrate just how difficult it is to get a rocket off the ground, even if that rocket is just suborbital and even if it only has one engine. But Skyrora is undeterred and they will be attempting a launch of their Skylark XL, which is an orbital rocket with nine engines in 2023. That's going to be an uphill battle to say the least, but given the fact that they've recently signed on Lee Rosen as their COO. Lee Rosen, of course, being a SpaceX veteran, I have every confidence that this company will be able to carry this out, if not in 2023, then certainly by 2024. Smash that like, please hit that subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space!